All the amenities you would like in your car, including satellite, serious satellite radio, and a hookup for your USB MP3 player. Now, look to the left. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an incredible piece of history. What you're seeing right here is an aircraft known as the Curtis Busher. We're going to take you back to 1911. This is the, a replica of the type of aircraft that on January 18th of 1911, Eugene B. Ely took off from the Tampa Ram racetrack near San Francisco, headed out into the San Francisco Bay, circled the USS Pennsylvania once, rolled into the groove, and trapped aboard the Pennsylvania, becoming the first man in history to make an arrested shipboard landing. This civilian demonstration pilot and his modified Curtis Pusher flew this proof of concept experiment under the guidance of Navy Captain Washington Irving Chambers and aircraft designer Glenn Curtis. Flying today is Mark Holliday at 55 blistering miles an hour and coming by what happened years later as Navy and Army Air Corps pilots learned to fly. This was the state of the art in the 1930s. The Curtis Pusher, state of the art in 1911. And look at this. The sound, the sights, all of it is just absolutely amazing as we see 100 years of naval aviation continue to take place right here at our show today. The fragile aircraft you see going over to the left now, that Curtis Pusher replica, is a handful to fly. It usually has about two hours worth of gas available to it, but after an hour, the pilots are really pretty tired. It is one handful to fly. Not very stable in pitch, not very stable in roll either, but in any kind of winds, these guys are working hard. The yoke is going back and forth all the time just to keep the wings level. And then as naval aviation continued to develop, there were three different levels of training. One was primary training. Then they went to basic training with an aircraft that was more advanced and had some more difficult systems for the pilot to master. And then they went on to the advanced trainers, the SNJs. Flying these two Stearman biplanes today. Oh, get your cameras ready. Look at this. Look at this. We're going to get them right in order. Oh, my goodness gracious. This is so much fun. Camera. Get my camera on. There are the Stearman's being flown by Carrie Harden and Bill Austin. Carrie Harden's from Starkville, Mississippi. Bill Austin is all the way from out in Concord, California. It doesn't get much more exciting than this. And those of you who have decided to come early are seeing this piece of history reenacted. 100 years ago it took place. The two Stearman biplanes, known as the Model 75, designed in the 1930s by Lloyd Stearman, Boeing Belt that bought his company, called it the Model 75, and then it became the N2S, the yellow aircraft closest to us in the lead, I should say in the trail pass here, being flown by Kerry Hardin. The N2S was also known as the Yellow Peril because of its narrow landing gear. It was quite a handful for a new pilot. The second aircraft that's being flown by Bill Austin is the Army Air Corps version of it, the PT-17, primary trainer 17. At the beginning of the war, Training lasted about nine months with three months in primary training. If the cadet successfully completed that phase, he'd move on to basic training in an aircraft known like the Volte Valiant, which, they were, which was nicknamed the Volte Vibrator. After that, they'd move on to the advanced trainers, the North American SNJ trainer, or what the United States Army Air Force called the AT, Advanced Trainer 6. Look at... 
Mark Holliday sitting out there in a white Curtis suit, and they even have the old Curtis emblem uh, screened on the back or embroidered on the back of those suits. You won't see the daredevil barnstorming tricks and thrills on the Curtis Pusher. But that was the state of the art a hundred years ago, when America was just emerging as a world power. In 1911, the Ford Model T was only three years old. Travel was still mainly by horse and buggy. Villages had perhaps one or two telephones, and most families didn't have indoor plumbing. They still went to the privy, to the outhouse, to take care of things that way. And indoor plumbing, yeah, it just didn't exist back then. The Steerman trainers coming by right now and making their turn, and they'll be coming, setting up to land in just a moment. We're powered by 220 horsepower Continental engines. And the Navy also used the Lycoming engine at about 225 horsepower. The United States Army and the Army Air Corps had three different engine airframe combinations for the Steerman. If it had a Continental engine, it was a PT-17. If it had a Jacobs engine, it was a PT-18. And if it had a Lycoming engine, it was a, engine, it was a PT-13. About 10,000 were built, but numbers of production, production numbers of aircraft vary widely, very widely in the history books that I've read. And, for, and, and part of the reason that those numbers are different is because there were thousands of spare parts that were available that never got put together to build an airplane. And so uh, the number of aircraft that were ordered and delivered sometimes varies from what people thought were actually produced. But it was around 10,000 for the United States Army and the United States Navy and also the Royal Canadian Air Force. They called it the KDET, the K-A-Y-D-E-T. Kerry Hart from Starkville, Mississippi is taxiing toward us right now. He also has a great blend of coffee that he, uh, that he sells called Stearman Coffee. And I've had some of it and it is delightful. Check Google Stearman Coffee and Kerry Hart and, and you'll uh, be able to get some of that. There's the Curtis Pusher. This is such a remarkable way to start today's air show. They've flown at a number of Centennial of Naval Aviation Events, C-O-N-A. I'll say Kona a lot today. If you hear Kona, just know it means Centennial of Naval Aviation. I want to give a shout out to my photographer buddy, Rich Kalasa, who's here. Rich, nice to see you. And I also think that uh, we've got Craig Scaling's gonna be here today. If he's not here already, Craig's gonna be here. Bunch of good photographer buddies who actually hang out on airshowbuzz.com. And I wanna tell you about that because if you're not familiar with Airshow Buzz, it is a tremendous website where you can join with tens of thousands of folks from all over the world who share a passion for flight. Airshowbuzz.com uh, has films and forums and uh, photos that you can post. You don't have to be a professional photographer with a 500 pound, $5,000 lens. Of course it helps, but uh, you can post pictures even if you've got a little uh, point and shoot camera like I have and share your enjoyment of air shows all over the world. So check out airshowbuzz.com. Mark Holliday touching down in the Curtis Pusher. What a remarkable aircraft we are seeing being flown today. It is the ultimate open cockpit experience because there's no cockpit even there. There is also a replica of the 1909 and 1911 Wright B Flyer made by Wilburn Orville Wright, which was the first aircraft, military aircraft produced for the United States Army Signal Corps. There was no Army Air Force back then.